Oh, thanks, Heather. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, starting out, I uh, find it interesting that uh, we're following Seattle in the, in the presentation order here, which is really quite appropriate because uh, we did try to model uh, many of our implementation elements uh, after Seattle's checklist approach. So uh, it's been very helpful to be able to uh, follow a community like Seattle and see the, uh, the detail they've put into the overall complete streets approach to transportation. So uh, what I'm talking about today is more uh, programmatic. Uh, it has to do with the fact that we're a much smaller city. We have a, a limited amount of time and budget uh, within which we can move through the, the, the actual delivery of complete streets projects. Uh, and so it's been very important to try to build a, uh, a process uh, that will allow us to uh, accomplish our complete streets goals over a long period of time. Uh, and in doing that, I've tried to talk a little bit about what we've been able to do to align those types of things, those policies and programs. Uh, and one of the uh, organizing elements about that was a complete streets framework, which I'll explain in a minute here. But as important as the whole concept of how do we get the complete streets elements implemented and, and in place, uh, it has a lot to do with what we're measuring. I know Dong Ho talked a little bit about that in, in terms of what Seattle's measuring. Uh, Pasadena uh, has moved over to VMT, uh, actually VMT per capita, uh, in place of level of service as a measure of our environmental impact of transportation. Uh, this is something that cities in California will be dealing with going forward as SB 743 uh, is implemented uh, over the next year or so. Uh, and uh, that would then make that requirement something I, uh, if those plans stay in place, they would be about, by, I think by 2020, cities would be required to start using VMT as one of the, as the metric for measuring transportation impacts. So we're a little bit ahead of the curve. We're one of three or four cities that are doing that. And this is a little bit of a talk about how we got to that point. Uh, in, compar com as a, in parallel with our work on VMT, we also uh, work to understand how to uh, deal with uh, measuring the effects that we wanted to look at on transit, uh, bicycle walking, other modes and how we've brought that into our overall transportation uh, analytics. Uh, Dong Ho talked a little bit about using multimodal level of service in Seattle. Uh, we have approached that, but have changed it slightly as we move forward here in Pasadena. The uh, other component of this is in that since a lot of what we're doing has to do with working with uh, uh, incremental development review and development projects coming in, we needed to make sure that we had a process in place that would allow us to take the type of review and, and analytics we were using on our plan levels that were telling us how what the ultimate success of our planning projects would expect it to be the outcomes we were looking for in essence, and how we would be able to bring those back uh, and apply them at the project level. And so we spent a lot of time working on how to identify and which elements to work with to make sure that our review at the at the, essentially the curb front level was was consistent with what we were looking at in terms of plan outcomes. Uh, and then, of course, then there's the framework of what uh, we were just hearing from Seattle, and that's really about how do you put the things on the street. In our case, we've worked with a design guideline approach uh, and then modeled into it a, a, a workshop-based approach that is burst off of the Seattle's checklist approach to complete streets. So moving into a little bit of the why did we do it, um, this is maybe a little bit less uh, it, and uh, relevant at this point, but it's since we're all sort of down this pathway. But in essence, uh, when we started doing this work, it was about 2009, uh, and we were working through to update our general plan. And in part of that update, we discovered that we were, all of our transportation metrics were not getting us to the outcomes that the general plan said we needed to be at. Uh, and so we took that to heart uh, and started moving uh, in a direction that to identify what would get us to the outcomes that we were looking at in the general plan, as well as to allow the city to align the state mandates for greenhouse gas reduction uh, and, the, and the adoption of complete streets, because now technically every community in California with the general plan has to have a complete streets element. So uh, we happen to be at the front end of that, and it's uh, helped us out quite a bit working with the complete streets strategies. Um, interestingly enough, what we were finding in the city, uh, we're sort of like one of Seattle's districts. Uh, we're about 140,000 people, 22 square miles. Uh, we're uh, relatively dense development uh, in our central district, uh, and uh, we have nothing but infill opportunities for development growth. Um, so it's something of what we were finding is, is that a lot of the, the impact analysis we were doing and the traffic impact mitigation that we were putting out was actually uh, working in the opposite direction of what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, so that what we we're seeing was a, a pattern where uh, our traffic impact studies were forecasting just massive gridlock over the city uh, that were just never coming to pass. Uh, because at the same time, we were looking at a long-term 22 quarters in the city that we were measuring for travel times uh, during different times of the day. 
and over a 10-year period, we weren't seeing very much change in the overall time it took to cross the city, regardless of the fact that our impact studies were predicting gridlock. So what we were seeing is a pretty good disconnect at the practice level there uh, that said our management strategies for managing traffic movement were working and that we weren't reflecting those outcomes in our impact analysis of new development. Um, at one level, that was causing us to misplace investment, which we have a limited amount of, um, and it was something that really helped us to galvanize uh, movement uh, to say that uh, we needed to be able to align what was going on here. Uh, the other big thing, and I'm sure we've all run into this in many places, is that we were not able to put in bicycle lanes uh, because we were down to the point where we had to repurpose a curb lane or remove parking, and we were just not making any traction with council or the community on doing that. And so our bicycle network is largely stopped at the edges of our central district, um, and that's where it's needed most. So we've been trying to remedy that going forward. The uh, programmatic approach is what we did uh, to be able to uh, organize these things was essentially to develop what I'm calling a vertically integrated approach to mobility planning, uh, and of course this semi-complicated diagram on the page here, but it's really about aligning the plans and programs, and our mobility element draws off of a general plan. One of the primary principles that Pasadena has had in place for almost 30 years now is the ability to move around Pasadena without a car. Uh, it's called out uh, quite uh, prominently within the plan, and it really influences what we do in the mobility element. Uh, and so it really gets down to understanding how do we organize things in a way that takes all of our planning components, our transit plans, our bike plans, pedestrian plans, our mobility plans for our uh, uh, system and our goods movement plans, and turn them into a series of, of processes that allow us to um, essentially incrementally uh, implement this type of outcomes over time. And that's really what we're setting up here to do with the development uh, of a street design guide, as well as then the implementation of those moving forward uh, with our metrics. The uh, complete streets framework was very important. Uh, it really was, gave us a way to sit down and look at our street system, uh, redid the street typing. We did a context-based approach to street typing within which we paired up uh, the frontage components of, a, of, the, of the uses along the street with the street design elements itself. And so we essentially used that as the basis of how we develop modal priorities as well as uh, sort of context priorities within the, uh, the street system so that we had a very nuanced approach to what type of design elements we need. And that's really what's driven our ability to uh, set target speeds, to try to set up and understand how much space is needed for various uses of the street system, uh, and to be able to be consistent about that as we go across the city. Um, obviously, this is what our street plan looks like. You can see we're, we're really much smaller than Seattle. Uh, we do have a fairly com uh, compact central district that uh, is rather L-shaped in the middle of the, of the uh, uh, diagram here. Um, we have used this then as the foundation for uh, all of our modal plans uh, so that we've essentially been able to set that up, and we've then uh, moved that into the development of a street design guide. Uh, this development of this guide was uh, funded by our regional uh, MPO, the Southern California Association of Governments, and so it's become a model piece for use in Southern California. Uh, it really uses a context-sensitive uh, solutions approach, uh, looking at a, a very collaborative approach to how we do street design and uh, what's going on. And uh, basically, we've been working with it to uh, use it with our Complete Streets uh, a process, which is a six-step workshop-based process to be able to develop projects with that. Uh, the context system right now is designed to work with either what's out there existing or what the general plan forecast is for the area, and so we're able to to uh, talk with the community about what those decisions look like and how they're moving forward. It has a basically a very heavy look at retrofitting uh, because most of our projects are retrofits. We don't really get to build any new streets here. Uh, so we're trying to fit everything into the existing right of way uh, and to make it all work. Uh, that's really then uh, what we've done is done a very uh, nuanced approach to trying to make it link with our development review process so that we're not looking at two different types of, of activities when we review projects. We've got uh, the same set of criteria working and the same steps moving forward here. Um, we're in the process right now of linking up uh, this with our uh, pavement management program, which is being rebuilt by our public works department at the moment, uh, and we're essentially building a decision making uh, support tool uh, that we're calling a Complete Streets Blueprint to be able to make sure that we get all of our citywide Complete Streets needs uh, identified and being able to prioritize them with the pavement management program so that we can economize uh, and get some synergy out of money that's being spent to repave and resurface the streets. Uh, we also have then spent quite a bit of effort trying to make sure that we have mode-specific examples within the design guides so that it's uh, very clear in terms of what we're looking for for transit stops, pedestrian amenities, pedestrian space, uh, and, and bicycle 
uh, facilities. The, uh, this is really a slide that speaks back to the earlier part about how we wound up getting to the metrics, uh, and this is uh, uh, what I've essentially we're working with is that, and I'm sure many of you have probably been in this situation here, is that we are doing, we used to be doing a lot of an evaluation of street operations and traffic volume changes. Uh, that's what people were looking for. It's what the community had been sort of conditioned to expect for a 20 or 30 year period here. And so they were very familiar with that. Um, what we were seeing as we came out of that framework was something that we were looking, very, very limited look in terms of how we were influencing the state's mandates, which is about reducing greenhouse gas. Uh, or about how we were meeting the city council's direction to basically make sure that people could travel without using a car if they so chose. Uh, and so really that then brought forward the elements of trying to figure out how do we start looking at transportation from the standpoint of how effective it is in terms of meeting these other criteria. The uh, other component of that then was is that we still need to look at what's going on with the auto traffic and the vehicular movement of uh, goods and, and services on the network here. Uh, and so we started focusing much more heavily on network performance, and this is an area where we've begun moving into uh, looking at travel time reliability and speed management, but using big data metrics uh, as one of the tools that we've been able to bring into the, the process at this point. So data analytics begins to filter into the overall activity once we start looking at network performance. What we wound up working through in about a four-year period with the community uh, to develop the metrics that we're using essentially set up this framework uh, and that we wound up developing a metric using vehicle miles traveled per capita and something we call vehicle trips per capita, which measures the intensity of an individual project's uh, land use um, activity uh, to be able to really focus on what, uh, how efficient transportation is being used by that building or that development. Uh, these formed our California Environmental Quality Act thresholds that go into our environmental impact statement reporting uh, and they're based on our existing citywide levels. Uh, for those of you in California, know that we're in the process with the SB 743 adoption of, of essentially adopting those threshold levels individually by communities statewide, and so we're continually looking at how the guidance from uh, the uh, Office of Planning and Research has come out uh, to be able to help us reset those thresholds once the SB 743 um, direction is actually implemented into state uh, practice uh, earlier next year and, and the subsequently. Um, all of these are focused, uh, we did this essentially using and developing a forecast model based on the regional forecast model that SCAG uses and we focused it down to the transportation zone level within Pasadena. So it's a fairly um, discrete uh, and robust travel demand forecasting process that allows us to get a very de detailed and nuanced look at transportation patterns within the city that we use for our impact analysis as well as our plan development. When we went to looking at how to address the overall system effects on bicycles and transit and pedestrians in relation to our general plan goals, we wound up moving away from a multimodal level of service and moving back more to identifying what is going to make it more likely that people will use pedestrians, or walk or bike or, or use transit uh, if they're in a particular development location. And really what we came down to was looking at the proximity to the type of facilities that would encourage them to use those modes. Uh, and so that's really what our metrics are based on at this point. They're essentially set up a network uh, based on our modal plans for our bicycles, pedestrians, and transit, where we have high f capacity transit, we have uh, effectively protected, and then not that we're showing a protected one here, but we're in the process of building protected bike lanes, uh, as well as uh, access to destinations. And so we then essentially, uh, all of our development in Pasadena, as Don Ho had mentioned in Seattle, tends to be channeled into a specific districts. Uh, that are, are identified in a general plan. And as a consequence then our facilities for bicycles, transit, and pedestrians tend to be localized, uh, the higher type facilities tend to be localized to serve those areas. And so by locating projects within them and in proximate nature or distance to our facilities, that is the, the level of, that we're looking to, to, accre to um, encourage here. So that's why you'll see with the bicycles, we essentially have said a level one or level two bike facility is either a separated or protected bike lane. Uh, sorry, I'm in the wrong place here. Uh, there we go. Uh, when we look at transit, it's really the proximity to our 15-minute uh, or more frequent service. Uh, and then you can see sort of how in the heat map on the right, uh, how that plays out in terms of our transit system. Uh, and as we looked at pedestrians and quality of the pedestrian environment, we, in the for process of trying to forecast this, um, it became very important to understand what we had the capability of dealing with. And so because we had a relatively robust land use component to our transportation forecasting model and our general plan land use element, 
we were able to use a uh, diversity of uses uh, within a particular traffic or travel analysis shed as a basis for making a, uh, an index that we looked at. We, this, if at one level starts out looking more like a walk score type of an approach, but in our ability to forecast it forward, it begins to get slightly simplified uh, to in terms of essentially access to different types of a diversity of land use. Uh, and so we're continuing to use that, uh, that uh, based on the principle that the more uses that are within walkable distance, the more likely uh, people were going to be to be able to walk to those. Uh, so those essentially form the basis for how we're looking at transportation. We then move forward to develop what we're calling our traffic transportation impact and analysis guide, very unique in the original title there. Uh, but what we wound up doing is putting together a hybrid approach, which for those of you outside of California probably says, well, why did you do that? Um, but it's really something that within California here, we do have those elements that are required and are mandated for our environmental quality metrics uh, that are established. Uh, and in this case, we wanted to continue to use a series of uh, analyses that didn't rise to the level of, of environmental impact, but really were more much more about the circulation effects and, and the quality of the access and mobility around the projects. And in doing that, we continue to work with the level of service metric, but we're looking at a much more localized uh, area around the project that we're developing or, or evaluating. Or the, uh, and then same way we're looking at traffic volumes that are and that their effects nearby, but they're all focused on neighborhood traffic intrusion uh, and how we're doing in terms of protecting our single family residential areas, which is a main part of Pasadena's general plan. And the idea that growth gets focused into higher density corridors. Uh, adding to that though, we do use at the citywide level and at the block level, uh, we've a couple of analyses that we uh, plagiarized from the San Francisco, which is called the, uh, the Pecky and Becky systems of looking at environmental quality index for pedestrians and bicycles. These, for those of you that looked at them, are very similar in terms of the metrics they look at uh, to the multimodal level of service for bicycles and pedestrians. Uh, again, looking at things that really influence the quality of the experience that a person walking down the street would see or a bicyclist riding by in terms of driveways, uh, different, uh, different amenities or different impediments along the way. Uh, and we use that as a way to focus our uh, localized uh, frontage level improvement requests for uh, uh, the uh, uh, development review. Uh, all of it, of course, in consistent with our guidelines in terms of reducing greenhouse gas and our ability to reduce VMT per capita. Our f all of the mitigation or the, or the project conditions that come out of these are really focused on reducing uh, trip making from the projects. And so it really results in a lot of enhanced travel demand management. Uh, as well as some uh, neighborhood level types of uh, traffic common components that, that get developed. Um, the city also, and I think this is very important as you, if you're thinking about working with a VMT based approach, uh, at least in California, it became very important in looking at it from the standpoint that there have to be other programs to assist in implementation. In our case, uh, we had experience with and were already using a traffic impact fee. We were able to update that to a VMT basis. We had in place a trip reduction ordinance, which essentially mandates travel demand management at multi-tenant um, buildings uh, that happen to layer on top of the region's uh, travel demand uh, employee uh, commute reduction program. Uh, and then we also had in place that we'd been using for a number of years something we called a neighborhood traffic management program that was focused on local streets, but we then expanded that to move up to all streets, whether they're um, higher type streets or just local access streets. And through that, then we essentially engage this, the public in a series of complete street workshops um, and uh, use that as a way to try to focus our outcomes as we're going along there. A couple of the things that has come out uh, that I think we need to not lose track of uh, is that we do take a very active role in monitoring what's going on in our management and operations. Uh, we don't have the ability to eliminate congestion in the city, nor do we want to. Uh, and so we are basically in the business of managing how our system operates to make sure that we're able to continue to maintain our goals of being able to allow people to travel across the city in a reasonable amount of time uh, and to be able to maintain speed management uh, on the routes, which is one of our major components as we try to keep uh, speed limits within a reasonable range and not have to modify the, the uh, setting of speed limits. California speed limit setting is, is rather onerous for those of you that know about it. Uh, and so our ability to keep speeds in the 30 to 35 mile an hour range as our faster speeds is, is really a big goal for us. Uh, we have one street in the city that has a 40 mile an hour speed limit and that's, even that's too high. So we're trying to keep things, given our residential density, down in the 25 to 30 range and it's very difficult. So we have a, quite a bit of effort focused on this and our program of speed management is a main component of that. Uh, to that then we've also added a series of, of elements that really look at how we're enhancing pedestrian environment uh, in, a, in a 
Los Angeles suburb, basically. Uh, so they're, we're limited, but we're slowly uh, chipping away at it. Seattle does a much more comprehensive program than we do, uh, but we are moving in that direction as we can. Moving ahead then, I guess the, maybe the short answer to the question of how are we doing is so far so good. Uh, slightly longer current is really, uh, um, to a certain extent, Pasadena, not Pasadena, but California-centric, is that what we are seeing is that the metrics are encouraging general plan compliance, which under our environmental quality rules and our overall general planning rules and, uh, and development review of process in California is very important because if we're able to maintain that compliance, uh, then we have uh, essentially are able to align with a lot of other state goals and, and, and essentially uh, fit in with under our regional strategies for growth management or regional strategies for greenhouse gas reduction. So it's, uh, it might sound simplistic as an outcome, but uh, it means that, that uh, things are working. Uh, we're seeing a lot of balanced mixed-use development in the city. We see nothing but infill development. Um, and uh, we've been able to, through the uh, judicious use of the resources within the city and the fact that we're able to use a forecast model with staff, we're able to reduce the amount of burden on the projects uh, that had been going on uh, when we were doing traffic impact analysis using more conventional means. Uh, one of the other big benefits is we've been able to take the process time uh, down quite a bit for the transportation side, which has helped get us out of the city manager's uh, crosshairs for holding up the, the uh, overall development review process. Um, and I think the one thing that we're still struggling with at the city level is the fact that as we've moved to VMT and away from level of service, it's shifted CEQA away from traffic congestion, which means that it's now more difficult to, to, for some opponent of a project to use the traffic conditions to hold it up. So everybody's trying to find new ways to, to, to model that and manage that process. It does allow for us to do a lot of consideration of traffic outside of CEQA. It puts a lot more emphasis on, like I said, our system management and measurement, but also on our transportation planning to make sure that we have a comprehensive approach to how our system needs to operate so that we know what our capital needs are going to be and we have a way to build those into our impact fees. Uh, kind of briefly, uh, we've since uh, getting our new metrics adopted in late 2014. Uh, we've been operating since 2015, essentially about three years now uh, with these metrics in place. We've looked at a number of projects here and you can begin to see the, uh, the criteria that we're working with uh, in terms of the outcomes of, of, of what we're seeing and how well it's working within the area here. Uh, each one of these has some detail. We're still requiring mitigation in certain cases, but the process is continuing to move forward uh, uh, successfully at this point. Uh, lastly, uh, kind of moving on here, uh, what we're beginning to find out is that uh, we uh, have what I call our Complete Streets Program or our, essentially our six-step process of workshops with the community works well when we engage it with a community that has decided they have a problem that needs to be resolved. Uh, and so we've been fairly successful in, in a series of corridors in the city where we've been able to achieve consensus on project elements and been able to essentially develop and identify projects that are now in design moving towards uh, construction in the next couple of years. What we're uh, seeing, of course, is our ability to construct is constrained by funding, uh, but, but we are in the process of moving to that. Uh, what we've run into recently is that when we haven't been able to go through the overall multiple step approach and to focus on communities where the community has identified an issue, uh, i.e. when we sort of show up with a planned project that was in the plan 10 years ago and we're now trying to do something with it, then we're beginning to get a lot of pushback on why are you doing this? Why do you want to do a road diet? Why do you want to change this? Why do you want to change that? Uh, and so we're beginning to rethink how we approach uh, those types of projects and sort of play from our strengths as opposed to trying to uh, rely upon our plan, uh, plan systems as way because it, it seems to be that if we're able to get much more into a hands-on framework with the community, uh, and work face-to-face -face across small tables, we're able to get a better outcome in the overall framework there. Um, our obviously our street design guide has been in use for about a year now. Uh, it's beginning to uh, filter into our use of pavement reconstruction projects in our public works department, uh, and that's really beginning to uh, finally show some, some uh, applications there. And like I mentioned earlier, we're trying to work on a decision support system that we hope to have in place by the end of the, uh, this fall. Uh, finishing up, um, Regarding VMT in particular, uh, there is a learning curve on this. It's very steep. Uh, it's something you need to think about if you're going down that pathway because there is no equivalence between VMT and level of service. Uh, they measure different things and they measure it differently. Uh, and we need to be able to explain those differences rather than trying to, to just sort of talk about them as equivalent outcomes. Um, we do find out that there are a limited number of mitigation options if the VMT production is too high. Uh, obviously, most of those focus on reducing the things that cause travel in the project and autos. 
Um, and I've, if you have a really good you know, mode share system or mode way to shift modes, that helps. Uh, we don't. Uh, we have a limited uh, sort of availability of non-auto modes for some of our travel, and so it uh, becomes much more about travel demand management uh, and how we're doing that. The one thing you find going forward is that at the moment we don't have a lot of really current research on travel demand management outcomes, particularly where we are layering the different types of travel demand management programs. Uh, so we're encouraging uh, that research, particularly at the TRB level, uh, to try to see if we can get a better set of metrics uh, quantifying those kind of outcomes. Uh, obviously, people are still concerned about traffic. Um, can't say much more about that other than that there's a lot of conversations going on. Uh, we just need to be thinking more and more about how do we portray how the system is intended to operate, what it's doing, how effective it is. And for that, we've been relying heavily upon our use of data analytics to begin to illustrate to people that that uh, the overall system is functioning, even if the time they choose to travel through it may not be uh, as quickly as they would like to. So uh, at least we're in the position of being able to help to have those kinds of conversations. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Heather. Thank you very much for your time. Fred, thank you so much for that engaging presentation. And thank you to both Fred and Dong Ho for being here today and taking the time to speak with all of us. We do have quite a few amazing questions coming in. We're going to try to answer as many of them as we can over the next eight minutes. Starting with um, a question, you both showed some examples of great projects and initiatives that you've been working on in your cities, but what can communities with slightly different contexts learn from your experience? For example, we got a question about um, working within a more constrained right of way where the streets are already narrow or implementing complete streets in small towns and rural places. Um, how can your experiences implementing complete streets in cities uh, help aid those communities in their own complete streets efforts? Um, I would say for constrained and maybe uh, not much resource uh, cities, uh, you can do a pilot program and what you want to be is very clear on uh, what the program goals are, if it's a goal to um, have community engagement uh, for a specific uh, uh, program such as uh, play streets and you want to have a uh, closure of a residential street or maybe an arterial street for a certain function, you just pilot it, uh, have, uh, have the goals be very specific. Uh, you want the barrier to be very easy and uh, uh, low, uh, no, no uh, permit fees, things like that. Um, and uh, uh, ensure that it's equitable, so that it's just the notice to uh, to the residents that this is happening. You have access. Here's the all. So make sure that uh, it's easy for people to uh, access and have good metrics. You know, how many people are using it? Is it, is it uh, utilized throughout the city? Uh, and that and then after uh, after the program is done, you can uh, you can definitely. Uh, See uh, if the electives wants want to fund that and make it permanent, or if it's been you know uh, uh, not very successful and figure out why. Um, and you can uh, decide whether to continue it or uh, revamp it. Oh, I agree. I, I don't that I have too much to add. Sorry. Our next question is for Dong Ho. Uh, you showed this map during your presentation, and one of the icons on here says very good transit. Um, so this question is kind of twofold. One, what specifically constitutes very good transit in this graphic? And more generally, how do you find, define success for your public transit in Seattle? Yeah, so for our transit network, we have a transit master plan that uh, defines uh, all of our frequent transit network, and very good transit is a transit service um, that provides transit uh, um, uh, every 10 minutes uh, in frequency. Uh, we want to do it higher in uh, other uh, other locations. Again, it's a reliable, you don't have to have a timetable, and that it uh, provides uh, a frequent transit that people uh, uh, can, can rely on. And Fred, our next question is for you. You spoke a bit about some of the metrics that you use to evaluate your Complete Streets program. Could you talk a little bit more about how you collect the data for that evaluation? Oh, yes. Um, some of it, um, obviously, is traffic. Well, we're doing a lot of it through uh, a combination of metrics. Um, we've uh, recently been able to move over to using a, um, a data analytics or big data, essentially, to do our travel time studies. We used to use uh, floating car techniques uh, up to a, a point about three or four years ago when uh, the other larger data sources and data sets became available and we were, went through a process of uh, comparing what we were getting out of the essentially the INRICS and HERE data effectively um, to uh, um, 
uh, as well as streetlight uh, data that we've been working with to find out if, if we were able to get con you know, a, an equivalence between our floating car runs and what we were seeing out of the, the, the other analytic approaches. And having satisfied ourselves that we were, we've been able to now move over to have a more robust um, look at in using a, uh, those larger big data sets to take care of our travel time uh, in essentially operations. Uh, we use uh, analytics out of our signal system to uh, keep track of queues at intersections uh, and how we're doing at individual uh, movement in certain elements of the corridors uh, that we have that we, uh, particularly those corridors we have priority operations in for transit. Uh, and so our traffic management center is able to use that type of information to uh, to, to essentially try to manage um, uh, the level of, of, uh, of delay within those corridors and keep, try to keep it at a manageable level uh, as we uh, move forward here. Uh, traffic volumes tend to be counted from a variety of things uh, as well as uh, working at basically you know, manual counts as everybody else is doing probably. Uh, we have some automatic counting and we've been moving more and more into use of our um, video networks. Uh, we have a lot of video detection now because of our need to detect bicycles. Uh, at our signalized intersections, uh, and we're able to use those data feeds on a regular basis to begin to augment our uh, conditions. Uh, we have yet to implement a, a full-time uh, bicycle count, uh, but we are intending to do so as part of a protected uh, cycle track that we'll uh, be installing over the next several years. Um, VMT uh, continues to be our model-based approach, uh, and that's something that we work at with the regional model uh, as we continue to update and keep our uh, modeling data uh, up to date. Uh, I think that pretty much covers it. Thank you. We have time oh, for one more question. Oh, I'm sorry, Norman, uh, did you want to add something? Just a quick one. We do have a lot of on -time, uh, real time monitoring of our transit system. So that's the other piece that's in there in terms of both on time operations reliability as well as the passenger boardings. Thank you so much, Fred. Um, so we have one more question for both of our speakers. Um, you both spoke a bit about different complete streets, projects, treatments, metrics. Um, have you encountered any challenges specifically for people living with disabilities or other vulnerable u road users navigating these new treatments? And if so, how did you account for that? Um, for uh, one of our projects, when we do our protected bike lanes, that's always a concern for uh, communities that have mobility challenges. Um, so when we build these projects, we ensure that uh, the access needs are uh, always uh, um, identified and, and uh, uh, provided. For example, on 2nd Avenue in our downtown, um, there is uh, uh, several locations where we have passenger load and unload zone right uh, adjacent to our uh, separated bike lane, and we will elevate that the load zone so that uh, a passenger can get right into the uh, same level of the sidewalk. They have a crosswalk marking, and uh, they have uh, 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 access to the curb space uh, very easily. And that's pretty much our experience. We have yet to, uh, we're in the process of building our protected bike lane right now, but that is one of the, the areas, uh, 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 particularly visually disabled uh, access across or in the area of, uh, in terms of the, the intersection crossings. Uh, we've chosen to address it with uh, using uh, traffic signal uh, controls in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a way that, 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 that minimize the, uh, the potential danger there. Uh, at those crossing locations. And so the corridor where it's currently right now has some unsignalized intersections or will all be signalized once, the, once we're completed. But that's the one area we've run into uh, uh, concerns from the disabled community about. Uh, I want to also uh, add into uh, 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 that conversation on, on visually impaired. So on the protected bike lanes in uh, in our downtown, we've actually, because uh, there's uh, we have some that are same level as the sidewalk. Uh, uh, we uh, engaged our uh, lighthouse for the blind and also the access board and tested out a new treatment that has a detectable warning uh, uh, along the uh, longitudinally along the on the bike lane, um, and then provide the truncated domes where the crossing is. So uh, that provides that uh, uh, clear uh, guidance for uh, blind pedestrians. And then we're also looking at crosswalks that are uh, uh, difficult to navigate because of the angles and the uh, 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 geometry. And we're using these uh, um, uh, uh, the Braille uh, uh, diagrams that sh uh, for a, uh, a blind pedestrian. You can tell what the intersection configuration looks like. There's a protected bike lane here. There's a island here. There's a transit lane here. Um, and it's the same uh, same uh, testing that the New York uh, DOT has done. Uh, we're trying to incorporate that into several of our projects in our downtown. Thank you both so much for taking the time to present today and for answering those questions. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. 
Unfortunately, we're about out of time. We weren't able to get to all of the great questions you sent in, but we have taken note of them, and we will be sharing them with the presenters. With, um, we'll be publishing a follow-up recap blog post with answers to some of those questions we weren't able to get to, as well as a recording and, some, and a PDF of the presentations. So look out for an email letting you know that that's been published. Um, and finally, if you're interested in learning more, make sure that you stay tuned. We're going to be continuing our webinar series in October with our next webinar. It'll be Small Towns, Smart Places, and we'll be highlighting examples of smaller places around the country using new mobility technologies. Stay tuned for more information about the exact date, time, and speakers that we'll be working with on that. Um, from the entire team here at the National Complete Streets Coalition, I want to thank you all again for tuning in and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.